Hello everybody and welcome to my first of two videos on this, the Pentax K1000. Before we jump in, I have two really quick favors to ask. The first is that if you are holding a Pentax K1000 right now that has the serial number 7634930 up here, um, just drop me a message. That was mine and it was stolen out of my apartment in September of 2018. So um, woke up and saw somebody running out of my front door with it and some other cameras. I uh, haven't seen it since. It was a gift, so uh, be very interested in getting it back. Or if it means a lot to you and you enjoy using it, just let me know that you have it. It's still out there being cared for and used, and that will be okay. And if you ever get bored of it, let me know, and uh, we can figure something out. Okay. Second thing is, if seeing all of this information that we're about to go over in print is helpful to you, there's a link in the video description to a Kindle ebook and uh, print book, which you could uh, rent if it's in the case of an ebook or buy for the print book. And you can follow along or have those to take with you when you're out shooting and you need a reference for how to use your camera. Okay, so plugging all of my stuff now being done, let's jump into how, what type of camera this is. The Pentax K1000 is a 35 millimeter interchangeable lens SLR. What does that mean? It means that it can use any 35 millimeter film, which will go in the back and we'll see that in just a bit. The lenses can be taken off of the camera and a new one can be put back on at any point when you're not changing, uh, when you're not taking a photo rather, and it won't affect the outcome of the image. So that's interchangeable lens and 35 millimeter. Any 35 millimeter film will work in this camera. Next up, the Pentax K1000 uses an averaging scene meter. Now, what that means is, let's assume that what you're seeing right now is what the camera is seeing through the viewfinder. The camera's light meter is going to read the entire scene and give you a reading that attempts to turn the scene a flat gray, the whole thing. Now, what that means is that if the whole scene is gray, then the things that are dark will look dark and the things that are light will turn light, and the things that are mid-tone will look mid-tone, and you'll end up having a properly metered scene. Uh, as, when we talk about tips for how to use this camera well, I'll have some pointers on how to make the most of the meter so that you can get the best images from your K1000. The camera gives you shutter speeds of one second to one one thousandth of a second, as well as bulb. Bulb is where you push down the shutter button, and the shutter stays open until you release the button. The viewfinder, which is this part right here, has 0.88x magnification, and what that means is that what you see in the viewfinder is 88% of the size of what's going to reach the film when the image is taken, and it has 93% viewfinder frame coverage. And what that means is, let's say that what you are seeing right now is what's on the film, then approximately 3.5% of the image on both the sides and on the top and the bottom will be on your film but not in your viewfinder. That means that when you get your images back, either uh, digitally or in print, you can crop them just a little bit. So if you're taking a picture and you're just slightly out of alignment, you can crop it and have everything be in alignment without losing any part of the subject. And that's if you fill up the frame with your subject or close to fill up the frame. The focusing screen in this camera is a fixed ground glass screen with a central micro prism. So if you look through the viewfinder of your camera right now, you'll see that focusing screen and the central fixed micro prism. If you have an SE version, which says SE up here, then you're going to have a slightly different viewfinder with a diagonal split prism. The flash sync on this camera is 1 60th of a second, which we know because there's an X next to the 60 on the shutter dial. X here, X there, not a coincidence. They both have to do with flash. And oh yeah, X here down by the PC port as well. That red X indicates flash sync at 1 60th of a second. Some fun facts about the K1000. There were more than 21 million of these that were made. So your K1000 is one of 21 million. 
they were also in production for 21 years. Does that mean they made exactly a million of them a year for the whole production run? I doubt it. I'm sure it was not that consistent. Um, and there's also not, to my knowledge, a way to, to accurately date. There are some resources online that will help you figure out approximately when your camera was made, but there's not a super accurate dating method based on serial number or something like that. The target market for this camera was the student or casual user, but primarily the student user. It's stripped down to only the most needed elements for taking photos. It's very simple and easy to understand in terms of the way that the interface is laid out and what all of the controls do. And also from a mechanical standpoint, it's also very simple internally with construction that is reliable and that's why here it is. The first one of these came out 45, 46 years ago as of this video's recording and they're still functional. These were made by the Asahi Optical Company in Japan, then Hong Kong, and then China from 1976 to 1997, 76 to 97. So in, they were only made in Japan for about a year. And there's a lot of internet mythology that if you have one with a, a serial number on top of it, that it was made in Japan. Not really. I've sold hundreds of these through my Amazon Marketplace store. And uh, I would say that about 85% of the ones that I've seen with the uh, serial number engraved on top had a Made in Hong Kong sticker on the bottom of them. The only way you can know for certain if yours was made in Japan is if it has the serial number on top and it had the Japan QC sticker on one side of the prism. If yours came with that sticker, then you can say, yes, I'm pretty confident it came from Japan. If it, it didn't, it, it may have come from Japan or more likely was made in Hong Kong. Hong Kong was the site where the majority of K-1000 bodies were made. If you have a K-1000 with a serial number stamped on the bottom plate, it was made in Hong Kong. There were some of the, um, the made in China bodies, you can tell, because they have a plastic inset with the serial number on them, and they have a bayonet style um, battery cap instead of a screw in. Now that said, I did just learn the other day that a small number, in fact, I, I'm only aware of one of these so far, of made in Hong Kong cameras, used the made in China body style, including the bayonet mount and the inset plastic serial number plate. Um, only, only aware of one of those. So I, it must be a fairly small number that were made during that transition from Hong Kong to Chinese manufacturing. This was preceded by the Spotmatic SP-1000 and followed by nothing. I mean, there was an, uh, an MZ camera that followed this as an entry-level camera, but it had way more functions. It really wasn't a true um, successor to the K-1000. So now as we do, let's go over some of the features on this camera and see what everything is. In the second video, we're going to talk about what everything does and how to use it to improve your photography. So on the top here, though technically on the front, we have the strap lugs. If you don't have these nice D-ring style strap uh, lug clips, which connect to your strap like this, any split ring will do. If you have a circular split ring or even these, they can rub up against your camera's finish and cause it to wear and look a bit beat up. If you want to prevent that, you can use some shrink tape or shrink tubing, that black plastic shrink tubing, around the uh, split rings and strap, and that will protect your camera's body. Here we have the film rewind knob and lever. The lever pops up, and when it comes time to rewind the film, I'll show you how to do that. This is what you'll use. Some cameras have a serial number stamped up here with a little bump there. Uh, flash hot shoe, that center contact is the flash trigger contact. That red X is your indicator that this is a xenon style uh, flash sink. So if you use a flash where you can use the bulb over and over and over again, something like this flash, let's say right here, this is a xenon flash. If you have to replace the bulb every time, that's not a xenon flash. The vast, vast majority of flashes and any one you could buy today that would fit in this are xenon. So um, 
most flashes will work and time properly. If you have a flash where the bulb has to be replaced each time, the timing will not work properly. Don't use it with this camera. Shutter speed index, shutter speed dial right here, and the index tells you what shutter speed you're selected up to. This is your ASA window. This tells you your film speed. ASA and, I and ISO are the exact same number. So if you have 400 ISO film, you would set your ASA to 400. Shutter button right here. And in the middle is a little threaded connector for a cable release so that you can use bulb, lock the cable release down, and then have a long exposure and not have to hold your finger on the camera the whole time. Film advance lever right here. There's a little window right here between the shutter button and the film advance lever that you might see just turned orange when I advance the film lever. And when that's orange, that tells you that your shutter is ready to fire. When it's black, it tells you that your shutter has been fired and it's time to advance the film. Frame count window. On the front of the camera, model, maker, lens mount, or lens release right here, lens mount, lens mounting index, and underneath this little black cap is your flash PC port so that you can connect a flash here and um, have it off camera. Let's get this reconnected. And then a reminder that this is an X-Sync flash port on the camera's bottom. What we have for some of them are going to be the serial number stamped into the metal plate for Made in Hong Kong and a plastic insert for most of the Made in China bodies. This is your film rewind button right here, tripod socket, and battery chamber. To get inside of the camera, all we have to do is lift up on the film rewind knob and the back should pop right open just like that, you can see. So here we have the film cassette chamber. These four silver rails are the film guide rails, and they help keep the film flat so that light focuses properly on it and moving smoothly through the camera. So these sprocket holes on your film rest on these inner guide rails, and then the film rests between the outer guide rails so that it doesn't move up and down as it travels. This is your shutter curtain right here, and this is what opens at specific timing to give you a proper shutter, uh, proper image exposure. This is your film tension sprocket, and as the film is advanced, this spins so that it pulls the film through. This is your film take-up spool. And in the second video, when we load film, you'll see how all of this works together. But this is where you connect your film so that it will pull the, so that the film can be advanced through the camera and taken up over here so that you can take another photo. This is a film tension roller, and what happens is when you close the film back, this tension roller aligns right here, and it puts a little bit of pressure on the film so that the sprocket holes on the film engage with this sprocket gear as it's moving through the camera. This is the film pressure plate. When the film back is closed, it's sandwiched up against these guide rails so that the film is pressed flat and light from the lens is focused properly. And then here we have a little retain cassette retaining spring. When your cassette is loaded inside of the film cassette chamber over here, that spring helps ensure that it's properly aligned so that the film moves smoothly out of it, and then when you rewind, moves smoothly back into it. All right, let's go over some tips for using this camera so that you can make the most out of it. The first one is, as I promised, has to do with the averaging meter. So the K1000 has an averaging meter, and that means very bright and very dark areas within a scene can throw your meter reading off. So if you're in shade with a bright sky behind you, and the classic example I always give of this is if you're at a cafe and you're under an awning and it's full sun and a beach or something like that behind a person you want to take a photo of who's sitting across a table from you, that's a classic example of this. So what you'll want to do in a situation like that, where you have very bright areas, like a very bright sky, or very dark areas, like you're taking a photo into a cave or something like that, and you want those areas to be rendered correctly or display correctly on your images, you'll want to look around in the shaded area where you're at and take a meter reading. So let's say, for instance, that you're in that cafe. You can take a meter reading off of the pavement underneath the awning. 
and get a pretty good meter reading. You can put the camera uncomfortably close to the person you want to take a photo of, take a meter reading off of them, specifically their face, and then dial in your settings and you'll have metered for the thing that you want to have be properly exposed. The bright areas will be overblown and that's fine, they're not important to the image. The dark areas will be completely dark and that's fine, they're not important to the image. What will be properly exposed will be the subject, which is important. So, what, so basically, take a meter reading off of something that is lit in the area that is a, of the subject, compose, dial in your settings to get a proper meter reading, which we'll see how to do that in the second video, by the way, and then um, recompose and take your photo. The second tip that I have for you is about battery preservation. The light meter is active when you have a lens mounted on the camera with no lens cap. So right now this camera's light meter is active. And what you can do to preserve your camera's battery is you can keep a lens cap on your lens. That helps to keep your battery from draining when you aren't using it. You can also, if you want, take your lens off and put a body cap onto your camera. That will help preserve your lens as well. Both of those are good. I do not recommend taking the battery out and putting it in upside down when you store it. That's uh, not the way it's designed to go in. And though I don't think it would actually damage the camera, it does cause the battery to be connected to the circuitry in a polarity which is opposite the way that it was designed. And I'm not sure that's a good thing ever for anything. Some things not to do with your Pentax K1000. Don't store the camera with the shutter ready to fire. So when you're done for the day, even if it causes you to waste a frame of film, trigger the shutter. If you leave the shutter with tension on it, this is a mechanical clockwork shutter. When you advance the film lever to arm the shutter, you're putting tension onto the springs. And that tension, over time, if left with the springs and mechanisms are left under tension, can cause them, especially with old cameras, to fatigue and it can throw off or or ruin your shutter timing, or cause your shutter just not to fire at all. So always discharge your shutter when you're done shooting for the day. A wasted frame of film is cheaper than a repair for a broken spring. Don't touch the shutter. So when you take your lens off or you open the back of the camera, the shutter's in there, don't touch it because your finger oils can kind of muck up the mechanism and you don't necessarily want that. Same thing is true for the mirror, which is right here. Don't touch the mirror. That's surface coated silver so that the silver is on top of the glass. Your finger oils can tarnish that, which can throw off your focus and your light meter accuracy. And uh, if so if you do touch it, just go ahead and I do have a video on this channel showing how to clean an SLR mirror. Just, you can go ahead and clean it. It doesn't tarnish like instantly. Don't leave your camera or lenses in your car. There are a few reasons for this. Heat can cause the lubricating oils in the camera and in the lens to get very thin because uh, they heat up. And then they get to places they shouldn't be, like on your aperture blades or different parts of the mechanism. When they get back to their correct viscosity, then what's going to happen is the parts that shouldn't be lubricated, like the aperture leaves, will not function correctly. Conversely, if you leave it out in your car in the cold, those lubricating oils can break down and get thick and gummy, and that can really affect things like your shutter timing. Also, a camera does have some resale value, and somebody who's inclined to break your car's window and take your camera because they want to sell it for themselves, seeing it sitting there on your passenger's or back seat, that could happen. So, good idea even if you're just going to pop into the convenience store after a photo shoot to grab like a banana and a pop or that's a weird snack combination, but okay. Anyway, um, just take your camera with you. Don't store your camera in a plastic bag or box unless you have a rechargeable desiccant pack because uh, moisture, plastic is moisture permeable. And once moisture gets in there, it's harder for it to get out. It will cause fungus to grow on your lens elements or in your camera's covering. A mildewy smelling camera is kind of awful, and fungus in your lens elements can affect your image performance. 
Don't let your Pentax K1000 get wet. It's not weather sealed. Water can get into the mechanism and cause components to rust or potentially short, and you don't want that. The short risk on these is pretty minimal. They have literally one wire going from the battery to the light meter, and then another one going from the mechanism to the flash sink. These are not electronic-based cameras, so really the risk of water getting in here is components rusting. And just remember that your Pentax K1000 is a precision tool that should be handled with care and respect. And as long as you take care of your camera, your camera will take care of you. So that's everything on the outside of the camera. In the second video, we're going to talk about how to use all of these different things so that you can effectively go out and start taking great photos with your Pentax K1000. We'll see you then.